Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the William James Lecture. I'm just going to read you just a brief statement about the lecture itself and then just a very brief introduction of our speaker today. So in 1968, the John Lindsay Fund gave the sum of $50,000 to establish at Harvard Divinity School a fund to endow the William James Lectures on Religious Experience for the purpose of having an outstanding scholar or scholars lecture annually on some aspect of the subject. The fund was established by Thayer Lindsley, um, Lindsley, son of John, who had a long-standing interest in William James as a teacher and in his religious ideas. It seemed appropriate to the trustees of the fund to establish these lectures in honor of William James at the Divinity School. James had earned a medical degree from Harvard and taught at the medical school. He subsequently was given an honorary doctorate from Harvard as well. James's uh, varieties of religious experience was based in part on a questionnaire about religious practices circulated throughout the Harvard community by one of his students. However, James Ames was not to defend religion by scientific proof. This, by the way, is not my writing. Uh, but, to stake, <laughs> but to stake out his own position as a piecemeal supernaturalist, one who admits miracles and providential leanings and finds no intellectual difficulty in mixing the ideal and real worlds together. This is a quote uh, from James's um, essay, Genuine Reality. Uh, and to do that, uh, to locate where, again, the ideal region interacted with the real world's details to cause experiences, prayer, epiphany, or visions that, that generate faith. The Divinity School inaugurated the, this new lecture series in 1970-71 with a series of four lectures and panels. Speakers in the years since then have included a number of notables, including R.D. Lang, James Hillman, Charles H. Long, Robert Coles, Carol Gilligan, Clifford Geertz, and Richard Niebuhr. Professor Obia Sekera is the first lecturer in the James series to address religious experience through the lens of Buddhism. So now this is my um, introduction of Professor Obia Sekera. It is my honor to introduce our distinguished invited speaker for this lecture, Professor Gunanath Obiasekara. And I do really wish I had the time to prepare a full exegesis of the depth and significance of all that Professor Obiasekara has attempted and achieved in his career as an anthropologist, a cultural historian, a historian of religion, and as a Buddhist intellectual. Indeed, it's the latter that I'd like to be able to think about most of all, but it's also that about which I can still say the least. Uh, maybe we will get an inkling of what it means for Gananath Obya Sekra to be a Buddhist intellectual. If not, in my few remarks, then in what we can discern in his distinctive angle of vision in the lecture that we will be privileged to ponder upon together today. Uh, I first became aware of Professor Obya Sekra's work with the publication of Medusa's Hair in 1981, a book that made a big impact upon religious studies and the anthropology of South Asia, a book presenting a remarkable body of fieldwork in which one is repeatedly struck by the intimacy with which Professor Obiasekra knows his subjects and the respect with which he discusses them, a respect I dare say is rarely seen in anthropological writing. It is also a book that is pathbreaking in the ways it calls upon depth psychology, pathbreaking especially for the, for, for the anthropology of South Asia and in service of a general theory of how cultural is, culture is produced. Professor Obisekra did his BA in English at the University of Ceylon in 1955. His MA and PhD were both in anthropology and both from the University of Washington. He is now Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Princeton University, where he taught from 1980 to two, until 2000. Uh, before that, he taught at the University of California and the University of Ceylon. His prolific and outstanding publishing career is notable not only for his exemplary and detailed ethnography of religious practice in Sri Lanka, such as was seen in Medusa's Hair and other books. Uh, Professor Obiasekra's work also consistently rises above the level of his specificity to speak to larger theoretical questions, both for the social sciences and the humanities, so much so that it has the uncommon distinction of being of interest to readers outside of both the field of anthropology and the field of South Asia altogether readers who nonetheless have been drawn to his work and provoked to think new kinds of thoughts about their own work. This is already a rare and admirable accomplishment, but Professor Obisekra's publications also reaches not only yet a third level in which in, in, in the way that he has challenged some of the most fundamental presumptions about the basis for anthropological method and regarding which he has engaged in a critical debate that has received great, a great deal of attention in the academy, uh, but his work also reaches what I would say is even a fourth level in actually blazing new trails and some truly unprecedented approaches to cultural history and the history of religions. 
Uh, the principal example of that third level uh, in which uh, Professor Obisekret took up some profound issues regarding human difference and human interaction uh, would have to be his famous and sustained debate with the anthropologist Marshall Solons over Solons' work on Captain Cook. And this very, very important debate, uh, for those students here who may not know it, can be reviewed by reading uh, Professor Obisekra's 1993 book, The, Apo the Apotheosis of Captain Cook, and Salin's equally spirited response in his 1995 book, How Natives Think About, Cap about Captain Cook, for example. In the course of this landmark discussion, we see the anthropologist and cultural historian Obia Sekera ende endeavoring to expose the history of European mythmaking, not only in the journals of Cook's crew, but still in the modern academy as well, uh, exemplified on Obia Sekera's view in Salin's own anthropology of the imputed deification uh, by Hawaiian natives of Captain Cook, a deification that Obia Sekera reads in a very, very different way. And now we also see a truly out outstanding instance of what I'm thinking of as uh, Professor Obiasekra's fourth level in his recent book, Imagining Karma, published uh, by the University of California Press in 2002, a tour de force world history of the relation between religious ethics and ideas of the afterlife using massively detailed uh, examples from Amerindian myth to Greek philosophy to South Asian eschatologies, all organized by the Buddhist category of karma which stands as that history's ethical telos. In, in a Buddhist studies reading group with faculty and graduate students last semester, we were astounded by the originality of the vision of the book, amounting finally, some of us thought, to a Buddhist answer not only to the old Weberian style history of religions, but even to the foundations of triumphalist Western self-conception itself that was her heralded by Hegel's philosophy of history. In a, in a recent email exchange over the last few days in which he was asked in preparation to the dinner to which the Divinity School has invited him if there was anything that he didn't eat, uh, Professor Obiasegura's reply was something like, we needn't fear, the only thing he doesn't eat is dog meat. <laughs> now, I think that was probably a joke about the British and that it also was a clue to his current book project about which I don't know much else beyond its current title, which is Cannibal Talk. Dia dialogical misunderstandings in the South Seas. Uh, but the talk uh, we're going to hear today, I think, is about another research project, although I may be wrong. Uh, and I've had also only a bare intimation of this one, too, when he told me some months ago, and to my great surprise, that he was reading my book uh, for this project, and then he asked me for some references about Tibetan visionary practices. So the title of this talk is The Buddhist Meditative Ascesis, Probing the Visionary Experience. The lecture will be followed by a question and answer period and then a reception to which everyone is invited. So let me introduce to you Professor Obi Sekro. Thank you very much, Janice. Uh, what time is it now? It's 5.25. So should I go until 6.25? Something like that. Okay. I need an hour to talk. <coughs> Well, thank you, Jenna. That was a very nice introduction. Actually, one of the best things I've heard about me for a long time. <laughs> I'm narcissistic enough. <laughs> um, and really, it is. Um, I've been here many times before, and it's so nice to see several of my old friends here. Um, and it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be invited to give this William James lecture. Actually, I found that I didn't know that I had such a pretentious title there. You know, the one I have here is simply says a variety of the visionary experience, <laughs> um, which is really what I'm going to talk about. Um, inspired by <clears throat> inspired by William James, uh, who, in his classic work, the varieties of the religious experience, <clears throat> that was about a hundred years ago, mind you. Uh, particularly his chapter on mysticism, which I think still has a message for us, you know. And um, that's the chapter that has sort of inspired uh, the theoretical thinking in my presentation today. So let me begin with a statement he made there uh, in that essay. One conclusion was forced upon my mind at that time and my impression of its truth has ever since remained unshaken. It is that our normal waking consciousness, 
rational consciousness, as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the flimsiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousnesses quite disregarded. Like many of us assembled here, James was far too much of a rationalist to be able to get into a mystical trance state himself. But he did try to approximate that condition by experimenting with drugs, in his case with nitrous oxide, which for me at least sounds pretty noxious, though not perhaps as bad as chloroform, which he also recommended for this purpose. <laughs> Sometimes his, uh, a large dose of alcohol would also say, say, serve the same purpose, he thought. Though this was an artificially induced state, his experiences did, he said, I quote, converge toward a kind of insight which I cannot, cannot help ascribing some metaphysical significance. And even, he added, a genuine revelation. It is this induced mystical experience where the opposites of the world are reconciled. He admits that this is a dark saying and adds, I cannot wholly escape from his authority. James certainly was aware that whatever the religious tradition concerned, genuine mystical experiences are often carefully cultivated and controlled and must therefore be of necessity qualitatively different from drug-induced states. In this lecture, I follow the footsteps of the master, but I must confess that I have not experimented with drugs and even an occasional overdose of alcohol in the days of my youth has not given me the kind of mystical insight that James was blessed with. Moreover, James was only peripherally acquainted with Buddhism, whereas I come from a Buddhist background, and alongside my sympathy for James, I also possess an intellectual affinity with thinkers like Nietzsche and Freud, who opened up the barriers that separate our normal consciousness with other forms of consciousness. I will tentatively open up to critical reflection a specific variety of the mystical experience that James dealt with more systematically in his epistemology of mysticism. Anthropology, the discipline I represent, has dealt extensively with alien modes of thought and has made detailed sociological analyses of such states as spirit possession, shamanic trances, but rarely as vehicles for thought or as modes of thinking. Like, unlike James, some of these studies have implicitly or explicitly tended to pathologize such mystical states. And this is also true of their popular characterization though such, through such labels as altered states of consciousness and out-of-body experiences. And though there are multiple forms of trance in the cross-cultural record, Every society outside the post-Enlightenment West held that, outside of spirit attack, forms of trance were desirable experiences, though difficult to achieve. It was almost everywhere believed that while spurious trances did occur, genuine trances provide access to knowledge that is outside our normal cognitive faculties during the waking consciousness. I want to present here a sympathetic phenomenological understanding of Buddhist meditative trance as a mode of thought that has virtually gone out of vogue in the post-Enlightenment West, but nevertheless continues to exist in many contemporary societies, including re religious societies in the West, I might add, and in the past of both Europe and the rest of the world as one of the most powerful ways of generating true knowledge, as once again William James acknowledged. However, it was not through William James that I came to understand trance initially, but from my study of the Buddha's own enlightenment. The process whereby he achieved the soteriological goal of nirvana while yet living in the world. The term Buddha means one who is enlightened. 
And the derivative term enlightenment refers nowadays to both popular and in both popular and ideological discourse to the Buddha's spiritual experience as he lays seated under the Bodhi tree, that is the tree of enlightenment, in deep meditation. Though the term enlightenment has come to mean the Buddha's own transformative spiritual ascases, there is some who still prefer the terms awaken or awakening which to me is the better translation of the Pali word Bodhi, from which the word Buddha is derived. My guess is that the late 19th century translators thought of uh, Theravada Buddhism, the southern form of Buddhism, not only as the original pristine Buddhism, but also one that was consonant with the spirit of modernity and science, namely rationality or reason. If Bodhi means awakening, that is the way I would like to say it, what one might ask, from what state one might ask, did the Buddha awaken? To anticipate my later argument, he awoke from a physical and spiritual death into a new life, very much in the way of an initiation ritual, imitating in his own inimitable way the lives of other heroes of myth. In order to understand this view of the Buddha's spiritual experience, one must take the Buddhist mythos seriously rather than relegate it into secondary importance, which is a strategy of many Indologists, as well as that of contemporary intellectuals in Buddhist societies, including my own Sri Lanka. So, European scholarships, you know, you, you take the Buddha, Buddha mythos and try to sort of rationalize it and see some kind of, uh, you might say, some kind of history behind that. That's the approach that I, I, I don't like. So instead, I'll try to give you a brief kind of get out of my text, so to, so to speak, and give you a kind of brief uh, synoptic uh, view of the Buddha's, uh, the Buddha mythos, his, uh, his, uh, up to his enlightenment, very briefly, uh, in a kind of summary form, if you'll forgive me for that, taking that liberty. First, like many heroes of myth, the Buddha was born in a miraculous way. His mother was observing the precept on sexual abstinence when he was born. Uh, so he was in a kind of a virgin birth, one might say, you know. Um, the Buddha, I, I, I point out in my book, Imagining Karma, for example, the Buddha's father was called Suddhodana, which, which I translate as pure seed. In, in other words, even the seed of the father sort of becomes pure. Uh, at his birth, it was predicted that he'll be a world renouncer or a world conqueror, if you borrow Tambaya's title. You know. He was born with the 32 marks of the great man. And of course, the father who is presented as a great king, you see, this is a mythic presentation. And anyone who tries to read that the Buddha's father was a real king, I think he's mistaken. You know. um, this great king, so to speak, wanted his son naturally. Who wouldn't to be a world conqueror? Nowadays, forget about it. <laughs> but, uh, um, so he had a palace in which the son was insulated from human suffering. Why? Not, not wine, not in that place. Women, song, and all the pleasures and luxuries of the senses. So the thing here, in my interpretation of the myth, is that the Buddha was a victim or a prisoner of hedonism, you see. So living in the house one day, he moves out into the street in his chariot, and you get the wonderful myth of the four signs. The first sign is what he sees, that is, a man bent into hobbling on a stick. He goes back and he's, what? he asks the chariot, what's all this? And then he says, that's the fate of us all. Then the next day, he goes there, he sees a person who is sick. And the third time, he sees a person dead with peeping, wailing over um, the beer. And the fourth sign was that there's a saffron robe renouncer who has transcended, transcended all of that, you see. And after that, he comes home, 
and he is told that a son is born to him. And Buddhists, ignoring Sanskrit etymology, it's a wonderful thing to do, uh, call, you know, his name was Rahula, which they translated as Feta. That is, someone who ties the aspirant to the world, to the home, life of the home, of domesticity. He bids his wife and child silent goodbye, and is, you know, about to give up the world, and sees the women of the harem without their beauty, you see, snoring, their bodies, so to speak, discolored, you know, and he sees, uh, you know, the skull beneath the skin, if you want to borrow uh, the phrase from T.S. Eliot, you see, the skull beneath the skin, which is kind of or like Baudelaire, you know. Um, and uh, he then goes with his charioter. He cr leaves the home, and in the horse is presented in, again in heroic terms. He crosses the river Anoma in one leap and goes to the other side. Crossing the river is what you do when you go on a pilgrimage nowadays in South Asia. I mean, in this too, it is leaving one form of life to another. He cuts his hair and takes to the homeless life. You know. and, um, and at this point, the Buddha follows the example of many of the Indian gurus. That is, he goes for instruction. And one way of instruction was asceticism, extreme asceticism. So you have again the initiation model. That is, the Buddha has not yet achieved his goal. He's still an initiate. He has given up his home. He crosses the river. Uh, he's still an initiate, and he has to overcome obstacles, which we know what happens in initiation rites. But these are obstacles are not of a physical nature, but of a spiritual nature. So one such obstacle is the practice of extreme asceticism. He said, you know, he flouted normal decencies. He ate little. He slept on, on pins, or whatever the people sleep on those days, you know. A matted hair, he had, uh, um, hair and, and so forth. He suffered extremely. And the effect of these uh, extreme ascetic practices, what is the effect? Because I ate so little, all my limbs became like the knotted joints of withered creepers. Because I ate so little, my buttocks became like a bullock's hoof. Because I ate so little, my protruding backbone became like a string of balls. Because I ate so little, my gaunt ribs became like the crazy rafters of a tumble-down shed. Because I ate so little, the pupils of my eyes appeared lying low and deep in their sockets. Because I ate so little, my scalp became shriveled and shrunk as a bitter white gourd cut before its ripe becomes shriveled and shrunk by a hot wind. If I thought... I will touch the skin of my belly. It was my backbone that I got a hold of. For because I ate so little, the skin of my belly came to be cleaving to my backbone. If I thought I will obey the calls of nature, I fell down on my face, and then and there, because I ate so little. So what's happening here? I think the text presents this as a death, you see. In fact, some of the gods said that the Buddha Gautama, or Gautama as it's in Pali, is dead. And people informed the king, your son is dead. You see? But we know, the anthropologists, we know this stuff. You see? Initiation writes, people don't die physically anyhow. You know? <laughs> it's a kind of symbolic death that you have. And, he, and the Buddha has to fulfill his mission. So in practicing asceticism, the Buddha has moved from the indulgence of sensual pleasures to its very opposite, the mortification of the body. He is now a prisoner of asceticism, from being a prisoner of hedonism. So he must overcome that too, and you have the famous Buddhist middle path, you see. So initially the Buddha started meditating under a banyan tree, and then moved to the, to the Bodhi tree, that is the tree of enlightenment, Sikhus religiosa, the tree 
in which he would achieve an awakening. Facing the east, again symbolizing a rising, he decided not to move till he had found out the truth of existence. The next great mythic episode occurs when meditating under the tree, he is assailed by Mara, death, who is also the eros of the Buddhist imagination, waging war against the Buddha. This episode is described in graphic detail in the popular traditions, and I shall not deal with them here except to say that Mara attacked the Buddha with multiple weapons, but the sage remained unmoved and untouched. Such being the power of the perfections, the moral heroisms practiced in previous births. Here's the crucial part. In the first watch of the night, he entered into the four states of meditation trance, leading to complete equanimity, which permitted him to recollect in all details <coughs> all his former existences, hundreds and thousands, and hundred thousands of them. In that continuing spirit, during the second watch, the Buddha saw with his newly acquired divine vision the long panorama of the passing and rising of human beings through the operation of the universal action of karma and rebirth. And in the last watch, which must surely be close to dawn and to a literal awakening, he discovered the nature of error and the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, and according to some accounts, the critical theory of causality known as dependent origination. This is a wonderful theory of causality in Buddhism. After this first awakening, when he becomes a Buddha or the awakened one, he spent another seven weeks in meditation, where he met with further spiritual adventures. The most famous of these, which you find in Buddhist paintings all over, is where Mara's daughters entice him with sexual pleasures. They tell him, you know, some people like old women, some people like virgins, some people like middle-aged women. We'll give them all to him. <laughs> See whether this will move him. You know, in other words, try to tempt in, uh, him with uh, eroticism. In other words, Mara's daughters represent the coming back of the women of the harem, you see, with their beauty, and now at this time, you see, in a, in a very interesting way. And the Buddha, of course, is completely unmoved because this is an interesting part of, of Buddhism that is unlike, let us say, the spiritual experiences of, let's say, Christian uh, mystics like St. Teresa or the mystics I discuss in my book, Medusa's here, eroticism is completely out, you see. Um, and after this, also what you have in the return, uh, in, the, in the Mara's daughter, is not only the return of the women of the harem, it is the return of the repressed, you see, for the ascetic. But he controls that, and he becomes now the fully awakened one. So, to me, yeah, I'll skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next section, um, you know, that's a very interesting part, but, you know, can't help it. Uh, it's what I call empirical time and mythic time. That's sort of central to this whole piece. Consider the Buddha's meditative experience where, you, where he sees hundreds and thousands of his past births float before his dimmed consciousness in the first wake of the night. That is during a period of four hours. In this kind of experience, empirical time or time as we normally understand it, in our waking lives, that is, gets stretched. There's a disparity between normal time and dream time, or between time and visionary experience, such that we can dream of long episodes in a few time-bound moments. I like to make the case that in many ways the Buddha's experience had his precursor in the dream experience so brilliantly examined by Freud, without, of course, reducing one to the other. That, I, I resist that. Let me start with the more easily ex <coughs> explainable feature of his awakening, where he experiences vast episodes in a brief sp span of time. This compression expansion of time was noted by Freud as a feature of, the dream, uh, of dreams, though he did not think it is part of the dream work. He describes a dramatic author who wanted to sit with the audience during the first performance of one of his pieces. I quote Freud. But he was so fatigued, so fatigued, 
that as he was sitting behind the scenes, he dozed off just at the moment the curtain went up. During his sleep, he went through the whole five acts of the play and observed the various signs of emotion showed by the audience during the different scenes. At the end of the performance, he was delighted to hear his name being shouted from the liveliest, with the liveliest demonstrations of applause. Suddenly he woke up. He could not believe either his eyes or his ears, for the performance had not gone beyond the first few lines of the first scene. He could not have been asleep for more than two minutes. You have, again, in the dream experience, this expansion of time, the disparity between what one might call empirical time or mythic time or episodic time. The brilliant psychotic Daniel Paul Schreiber, one of my favorite characters, also mentions a similar compression expansion of time in his memoirs. I quote, From the sum total of my recollections, the impressions gained hold of me that the period in question, which according to human calculation stretched only three or four months, had covered an immensely long period. It was as if single nights had the duration of centuries, or that within that time the most profound alterations in the whole of mankind, in the earth itself, and the whole solar system could very well have taken place. Again, this man is having fantastic visions of expanded cosmic time. Again, in another beautiful uh, passage, he describes how he is seated in a carriage or a lift, and the lift just goes down under the earth, you see, down below. And there he sees the whole evolution of humanity, the whole evolution of humanity, not in the Darwinian sense, from the past to the present, but from the future to the present, you see, starting with his wife's grave, and his wife was alive at that time, you see. So it's a kind of reversed evolutionary sequence that he sees. But again, in this brief spell, a few minutes or hours, he sees this vast expansion of time. Going underground is, has a double meaning, a literal meaning and a symbolic meaning. He's going down into his unconscious. Later on in the dream book, Freud, in accordance with the view that there is no real creativity in dreams, asserted that such dreams did not produce any fresh thoughts. That's a very Freudian thing, I think, very, in my view, wrong, during sleep, but rather, quote, may have produced a piece of fantasy activity which had already been completed during the, during the day. By fantasy activity, he means a prepackaged fantasy that reappears in the dream and consequently possesses a coherent form. In this situation, there is no distortion, which is sort of crucial for Freud's notion of the dream work. The dream work, he says, is glad to make use of the ready-made fantasy instead of putting one together out of the material of the dream thoughts. Here, then, is an interesting idea of a type of dream existing outside of the dream thoughts, even though dominated by unconscious fantasy and wish fulfillment. I believe, however, contrary to Freud, that both fantasy activity and original and creative thinking appear in the Buddha's visionary experiences and that of others like him. The next portion, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, cut down very, uh, to its bare minimum, which is the earlier idea dealt with the sort of uh, con contraction, expansion of time, sort of uh, ordinary time, mythic time, episodic time. Here, what about space? Now, of course, you know, you see, uh, in, uh, in Buddhism, uh, these, some of these people, uh, as uh, Janet's book uh, uh, shows, you know, these the treasure seekers and so forth in Tibet, they are wonderful characters, um, uh, to some degree like, like shamans in the classic Siberian sense, you know, who, who sort of had these great space explorations. Uh, in other words, one of the interesting things which I plan to explore later on in detail is how space gets filled in with images, you see. Uh, one might, in Christianity, of course, one, one thinks of the apocalyptic uh, revelation of St. John the Divine. Again, you have a similar phenomenon. But these Tibetan guys, uh, they're out of this world, I mean, in two senses. Um, but so dealing with that, which I can't in, 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 this, show, in this lecture, I, deal, I, I, I have some examples of a similar 
distinction between empirical space and cosmic space. And I have examples from uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, the Christian mystic, uh, and Pema Linka, uh, the Tibetan mystic, who saw the world like a myrobalan flower in the palm of his hand. And uh, Julian of Norwich, who said that Jesus showed uh, the soul residing uh, in her heart, and this soul was a huge city in which God was seated, Jesus was seated at the center. You see, again, you have this. And, of course, the wonderful example from the Hindu tradition, uh, the Bhagavad Purana, uh, the great text of devotional Hinduism. And here it's about Krishna. That's the one I quote. One day when Krishna was still a little baby, some boy saw him eating mud. When his foster mother, Yasoda, heard of it, she asked the baby to open his mouth. Little mouth of his. Krishna opened his tiny mouth. And wonder of wonders, Yasoda saw the whole universe, the earth, the stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, and innumerable beings within the mouth of baby Krishna. You see, once again you have that wonderful phenomenon. Unfortunately, I don't have many examples of that as, as I do for, for time. Yeah, this is for space. I think this is a the third part of this is, is the most controversial part. I think I have to take my jacket off. You should see. I think. <laughs> yeah. I call it mode of thought, the it and the I in visionary experience. I now present perhaps the most controversial part of my argument, namely what I think by, is meant by the Buddha giving primacy to knowledge acquired through concentration which requires the abandonment and the emptying of the mind of discursive knowledge and its readoption, the readoption of discursive knowledge after the experience is over. In my view, a special kind of thought operates in this meditative ascesis. The agency involved is not the I of the discursively reasoning and active consciousness. Rather, it is the it, if one wants to use a Nietzschean term, not to be confused by the Freudian, with the Freudian id, at least. Uh, not for the moment. Nietzsche says, a thought comes when it wishes and not when I wish. So it is a falsification of the facts of the case to say that the subject I is the condition of the predicate think. It thinks. But that this it is precisely, precisely the famous old ego, very sarcastic about Car the Cartesian stuff, is to put it mildly, only a supposition, an assertion, and assuredly not an immediate certainty. That's a direct critique of Descartes. For Nietzsche, even it thinking is tainted with agency, compelling one to think according to grammatical habit. It seems that Nietzsche is highlighting a form of thinking seemingly, I emphasize that word, without agency. But for purposes of convenience, I will borrow his trope and call it it thinking. I do not, however, believe it thinking is the only way of knowing or that it is preferable to I thinking, except that it is one way of thinking, a way that has virtually gone out of vogue in Europe with the Cartesian I think, I am. In similar Nietzschean fashion, William Butler Yeats spoke of the frenzy that possessed William Blake, such that truth obeyed his call. I love that, but I wanted to quote it, but I've forgotten it. So with the Buddha, I love that phrase. Knowledge appears before the Buddha in his state of intense concentration, which gives him the capacity for divine vision. Not only can the Buddha see the coming into being and disappearance of people and worlds and thoughts, but thoughts also appear before him. Once he has achieved his spiritual awakening, he has further adventures, this time in an entirely vivid, imagistic and visual form, when he is attacked by Mara and then by the daughters. The Buddha's spiritual experience entails the furthermost development of the kind of thinking that I think Freud also without sometimes knowing, formulated in the dream book. 
So once again we must go back to Freud's insights into this great work, The Interpretation of Dreams, where he develops the intense visuality of dreams. That one might say that is to some degree obvious, but the point is that discursive thought does not enter into dream representations. Freud constantly emphasized the fact that dreams are thoughts transformed into images. That is, you can't have abstract thoughts without being transformed into pictorial forms. That's what I'm trying to get at, you see. <clears throat> so the Buddha might have had very abstract thoughts, but it was transformed in, in, into images. He adds, dreams hallucinate that they, that they replace thoughts by hallucinations. This, moreover, means that the causal and logical thought processes that are associated with the waking consciousness cannot appear in the dream without being reformulated as indirect representations, a key word in the Freudian lexicon. Freud even asserts that no cannot be represented in the dream. Aside from his visuality, the dream simply appears before one's dimmed and diminished consciousness. Even the dark dream thoughts that precipitate the manifest dream merely rise to the surface with the near suspension of active consciousness. Nevertheless, though Freud mentioned that dreams are egotistical, you see, this did not mean that I appears there. When I appear in a dream, it is externalized, you see, as an image that appears before me. Hence the dream, said Freud, my, the mind functions like a compound microscope or a photographic apparatus. We all know that for Freud, the ego is not the master of his own house or into the power of unconscious thought, thus implicitly at least dethroning in the primacy of the Cartesian consciousness. Nevertheless, though not explicitly stated, the dream book, I think, has a much more radical, much more radical and interesting position. The I or ego does not appear in the formation of the dream in the first place. The physical person appears externalized, as I mentioned earlier. What is striking about the dream work, that is the processes that transform thoughts into images, is that condensation or metaphor and displacement or metonymy can occur without the I being involved, though this is not how Freud himself formulated the issue. Even the sensor, the, super, the later superego, it's what I call it, the sensor, much more interesting term. The dormant conscience of the dreamer, in, who in wetting the dream, that in wetting the dream distorts it, that's the sensor, is a kind of mechanism that operates the, without the silently thinking I, or the superego of Freud's later work. It seems, therefore, to me that the dream book introduces a radical model, model of the mind that eliminates the ego or self, or I, or I, <coughs> and yet, paradoxically, introduces a form of agency, if one want to call it that, that is totally impersonal. Thus the Freudian model of the dream book, sometimes labeled as a first topography, which I have extrapolated from this great work, is not the structuralist one, like Levi Strauss's, which eliminates agency, but that deals with a special form of agency. So what's interesting about the dream book is that prior to the dream book, you see, in, uh, in 1895, wrote, uh, Freud wrote the project for scientific psychology, which was published only posthumously. The same year, he wrote that wonderful book, which I'll deal with presently, uh, with Breuer, called Studies in Hysteria. <coughs> Now, oh, the interesting thing is in studies in history, a lot of Freud's later terms appear. Also, both in the project and in studies of hysteria, the I, the ego, constantly appears. But in the dream book, there's no such thing. And after the dream book, virtually everything that Freud wrote has to deal with not only the I, but with the id, which is another kind of I. Uh, yeah, it kind of thing, you see, and also a super eye, you see, or eye, you know, the super ego. So, um, I, I find, you know, that tripartite division of the mind not very, for me, of course, not very interesting. So you have, then, uh, in the, 
in the first topography, you have uh, a model of the mind that fully rejects the Cartesian centrality of the ego. It is here one senses Freud's unacknowledged debt to Nietzsche. So, I now want to just switch a little bit and talk about uh, uh, not the dream book which has its immense concern with uh, it thinking and uh, visuality, but the studies in hysteria. Here too, what you have in Freud's hysterics, Freud and Breyer both wrote this, you see, is that these so-called hysterical female has these brilliant visual images, you see, and they get into it like this, or in a kind of hypnoid state, uh, and so forth. Now, one of these was Freud's patient, Elizabeth R. Elizabeth R. had fantastic dreams, you see, and she, the sort of visions, I wouldn't call these dreams, she had these visions. And uh, in these visions, she gave allegorical meaning to them, you see. Uh, for example, um, I give you an example. She describes, then came a gigantic lizard which regarded her inquiringly but not alarmingly, Freud says. Then a heap of snakes, then once more sun, but with mild silver rays, and in front of her, between her and the source of light, a grating which hid the center of the sun from her. I had known for some time that I had to deal with were allegories and at once asked the meaning of this last picture from the patient. She answered, without hesitation, the sun is perfection, the ideal, and the grating represents my weaknesses and faults which stand between me and the ideal. You see, and she goes on like that. But Freud simply did not permit that to enter, in other words. So my argument is that if these women were in Sri Lanka or in ancient Greece, they would have been wonderful priestesses, you know, and, uh, and the work of culture in those areas would have permitted them to express this propensity in publicly acceptable terms. So you, what, you, what you have then in, 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 in uh, Freud is also another interesting feature he mentions. He says that these pictures, I quote him, emerge from the patient's memory, but she, as she proceeds to describe them, the visual experiences become more and more fragmented. That is, when the patient tries to put the it experience into I terms, it becomes fragmented. Freud adds that sometimes the pictures remain obstinately, but uh, this is because the patient still has something important to say about the pictures. When this has been done, you know, this is a wonderful line, the picture vanishes like a ghost that has been laid. You see. Right. So once you so in other words there's this sort of this vivid pictorial imagination then goes away the moment Freud asks her to explain this in, in verbal terms. You see. So what you have then is a, a society of Freud's time, Victorian Europe, that did not permit uh, these very talented females to give expression to their allegorical thinking, in other words, you see. Uh, just, just as it did not permit Schreber, which is wonderful, absolutely brilliant man, these wonderful images uh, to be treated anything but uh, psychotic, you see. So, Breyer's famous patient, Anna O, oh, in a self-induced hypnotic state, had frightening hallucinations of black snakes, which she saw her hair, ribbons, and similar things, all as snakes, just like the women in my book, Medusa's Hair, which then links up, contrary to our anthropological prejudices, of women in Victorian England with women in Sri Lanka, you see. Not to mention Medusa herself, of course. In the cases of hysteria cited by Breuer and Freud, the picture mode of thinking disappears when I think in supervenes. I am suggesting that a similar form of thinking characterizes the visions of shamans and spirit mediums. The vivid hallucinatory knowledge appears before the tranced individual. The dream work as a seemingly impersonal and mechanistic process led Freud to conclude that inventiveness and creativity do not appear in the dream work contrary to all the evidence he produces. 
that dreams are really rich in, in, in content. Of some people, some people of course can't dream anything interesting. Um, I, uh, and if you take surreal dreams, you know, like which Freud is, uh, they are uh, very, very interesting. Freud could not think of his hysterics as creative people, or that pathology might have a creative side to it. That, which was what James pointed out. You see, James pointed out that very clearly. And precisely because of their pathological nature, the patient's creative visual thinking cannot be permitted to remain in her mind. The Freud, for Freud, the attempt, patient's attempt to give allegorical meaning and significance to her visual images could not possibly have a curative function. He and other analysts thought that creativity and innovation must reside, but then must entail the actively thinking I, and this is sim that this simply could not occur when consciousness is suspended. For example, regression in artistic creation must be in the service of the ego, as Ernest Chris, Heinz Hartmann, and others have erroneously, I think, argued. So you see, actually, even in psychoanalysis, you get this, this uh, phenomenon. So after all, the patient is lying on a couch, isn't he? I mean, sort of normal consciousness is, is I mean, what do you lie on a couch for? Oh, well, not for sex in this instance, but for the suspension of consciousness. So here, you, the free association takes place during that situation. Free association, and this is Hilda Doolittle, who was analyzed by Freud, pointed this out beautifully, you see. He, she, he said, let the impressions come to me. I do not make the impressions. Let them come to me. Let the thoughts come to me. That's exactly what I meant by truth the way it is called, which incidentally now I remember what the lines were, you see, because it applies to me as an old man and to Yeats as an old man and to Lear and to Blake. And the lines are, grant me an old man's frenzy Myself must I remake till I am time and all year, or that William Blake who beat on the wall till truth obeyed his call. You see, that's what I'm trying to get at. Truth obeyed his call. So, so in the in mature psychoanalysis, you get the what is the analyst? He's a stand-in for the rational consciousness that has been suspended. So it is in Buddhist meditation. In Buddhist meditation, the real one, not the five-minute meditation, yeah, nothing to do with that. You see, it's good, I mean, it's good, but, you know, not for me. Uh, you know, the real Buddhist meditation represented the Buddha himself. It's a pretty serious kind of business, you see. You have a person called the Kalyanamitra, the true friend. The Kalyanamitra, or true friend, is the one who, when the visionary is terrified by dark thoughts and terrifying images, you see, guides him in some way. You see? It's not an impersonal person. True friend it has to be. So the Kalyanamitra is also a stand-in for the rational consciousness that has been suspended. So I think, you see, the Buddhist meditative ascasis is a furthermost development of its thinking, and no wonder the Buddha says that one must suspend discursive thought, I thinking, as a prerequisite for achieving the former, and, in this, and this in turn entails the overcoming a false notion of I according to Buddhism. The crux of meditation is to develop its thinking, in my usage, both in its visual and imagistic forms, and what I might tentatively call is free associational forms, such that even philosophical ideas, truths, appear into the field of the thinker's vision or unconsciousness without the mediation of egoistic discursive thinking. James makes a similar point in relation to the neotic quality of mystical knowledge, to quote him. Mystical states seem to those who experience them to be also states of knowledge. They are states of insight into depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate, though they remain. Not all is inarticulate. That's where I disagree. You see, in the Buddha's case, they are articulated. After the dream, uh, after the experience is over, then you have the Buddha has to rearticulate those terms to his audience. So, 
when you re-articulate those terms to his audience, then you have to use the I, you see. So, the real, very interesting thing about this uh, mystical experience is that the experience is what I would call it thinking, but when it thinking is over and you have to communicate, just like you had to communicate in a dream, but unfortunately when you communicate in the dream, like in his text, the dream vanishes very often, you see. But here, because these are trained personnel, through rigorous training, they don't have that problem. They can remember those things. And then, they can then articulate that to their disciples. And as you know, Buddhist texts are full of rational thinking. So the point I'm making is that the Buddhist rationality or conceptual thinking that you get in Buddhism exists in a kind of dialectical relationship with this sort of meditative ascesis. In other words, there's a flip-flop relationship between the it and the I in mature uh, meditation. I think I missed all sorts of things, but just forget about it. Now let me conclude this. I have about 15 minutes. The conclusion. Let me now qualify my argument that both the Greek and the European Enlightenments were hostile to the idea of it thinking in their different ways. Such forms of thinking cannot be eradicated entirely. They persist in the dream work and in psychosis. And this makes for their being tapped by such modern movements as surrealism and in the unusual introspection of Nietzschean thinkers like Georges Bataille and many other modern and postmodern thinkers whose work has been discussed at length by Louis Sars in an interesting book, Madness and Modernism. Yet I think there's a problem here. Nietzsche and many modern and postmodern thinkers are critical of the Enlightenment project with his iron cage of rationality. Yet, can one living in the modern world escape from rationality's bondage? Or, to put it in early Nietzschean language, borrowed one Schopenhauer, can one pierce the veil of Maya? It's a wonderful phrase. For Nietzsche, the Dionysian, in his ecstatic entrancement or intoxication, can do it because his work is an annihilation of the usual borders and limits of existence. I quote again. Something supernatural sounds forth from him. He feels himself a god. Now he, feels him, now he himself strides forth as enraptured and uplifted as he saw the gods stride forth in dreams. Man is no longer the artist. He has become the work of art produced in the shudder of intoxication. Yet it is one thing to sketch the lost past, as Nietzsche does, in The Birth of Tragedy. And, of course, to the very end he maintained this Nietzschean, um, Dionysian idea. Or to imagine a powerful figure like Zarathustra as a model prophet of the future, However, it is another thing to become Zarathustra, to incorporate him into one's own being. And even more difficult to be able to create such things as visions and ecstatic trances in the field of modernity, even for those who have intellectually rejected enlightenment, rationality, and the primacy of the ego. Sure, there is art and music as expressions of the sublime. And one can re-enchant the outside world in many ways. But what about the inner experience? A phrase used by both William James and Georges Bataille. How many can become the living artists of Nietzsche's model? If indeed the living artist as an ideal mode of being is, is, isn't itself an illusion. As Edwin Muir literary critic, translator with Will I's wife of Kafka, poet and mystic, 
put it in relation to his own translate, uh, of his own trances. I quote, I use the trance for a poem, but the poem seems a trifling result from such an experience. Most of us are caught in Levi Strauss's structuralist dilemma. Levi Strauss rejected the agency of the ego, yet his work is in the true spirit of science. It is Apollonian in a very narrow sense, because it is without the benefit of living in the magic mountain, the domain of Apollo. For Levi Strauss, as for many of my generation, ethnography was once upon a time a way out of modernity by living in worlds outside of modernity's discontents in a temporary fieldwork sojourn, which afterwards is converted into a newfound land of the imagination. Similar dilemmas present themselves in many of the great figures of our time who have rejected enlightenment thought. Heidegger wanted to create, like Nietzsche himself, an authentic mode of existence, but it led him tortuously into the blind alley of fascism, a land into which Nietzsche himself came close to trespassing. Wittgenstein passionately defends St. Augustine. I, I, I like Wittgenstein very much. He himself periodically lived in isolation in the cold north, very much like a medieval mystic, but he was too much of an abstract thinker ever to be able to become someone like Augustine. Even those post-structuralist thinkers who protest against the rationality of the Enlightenment end up as prisoners of rationality. Foucault is a prime example for us, anthropologists and many of us modern thinkers, of an anti-rationalist rationalist who tried to pierce the veil of Maya in his own personal life through sexuality, through the ingestion of hallucinatory drugs, through the visceral life of San Francisco's gay bars. There are only a very few that can remain a modern or postmodern European and achieve a mode of being or non-being that one associates with visionary trance and yet remains sane. Hence the importance of modern thinkers like Edwin Muir, whom I just mentioned, who can reject rationality even while living and acting in a rational world and, an ab and unabashedly accept visionary trance as a revelation of a truth. Or as the Buddhists formulated it, one can accept rationality in the nominal or conventional sense and reject it, reject it on a deep intuitive level. It is not surprising that Muir was born and raised in the remote Orkney Islands of Scotland in a deeply religious Protestant community. As an adult, he was converted into a Nietzschean worldview, and he had Nietzschean dream visions, whatever that was. But soon, especially after severe mental dejection, his word, he went into Jungian psychoanalysis, and then experienced dreams, visions, trances that began to come in crowds, he says. These visionary experiences were expectably in the Jungian style, which was not hostile to what Muir calls mythological dreams, and which, for Muir, but not for his analysts, provide, provided intimations, if not proof, of immortality. At the same time, he could continue to play both Nietzschean and Jungian language games. For example, when he says about a dream vision, that it was not I who dreamt it, but something else. No wonder Mia felt obsessed with time. These are all this wonderful line by Thomas Hardy, you know, <coughs> time torn men. He was obsessed with time. And imagine he was 250 years old. And that, spiritually speaking, he was born before the Industrial Revolution. If Elizabeth R.'s visionary interpretations was, were denigrated by Freud's own rational consciousness, and his Schreber's were relegated into paranoia, not so with Mir, who could speak to those willing to listen to or read about his mystical experiences in his sane autobiography, as did Schreber in his mad memoirs. And in the spirit of this paper, 
Muir could clearly indicate the basis for his and others' visionary experiences. No, I'm quoting, no autobiography can confine itself to conscious life, and that sleep in which we pass a third of our existence is a mode of experience, and our dreams a part of reality. Like Muir's, the Buddhist meditative ascesis can coexist with rationality, but not in the same space-time. It is this rapprochement with rationality that makes Buddhist meditation appealing to many modern intellectuals of the Apollonian type. Now let me look at Buddhist theory and practice once again in relation to the problems posed above. The Buddha never defined nirvana as such. And when he was asked about nirvana, the sage remained silent. The silence of the Buddha is generally understood in European thought and by Buddhist intellectuals as a recognition of the impossibility to speak of the soteriological experience. The idea that Plotinus' wonderful lines, the vision baffles telling, or in the spirit of Christian negative theology, you see, the cloud of unknowing, you know, and so forth, which I want to bring when I later write this up, you see, bridging the gap between these different religions. I think this is correct. Nevertheless, through his silence, the Buddha is invisibly pointing to something, it's an ostensive thing. Namely, the silence of meditative ascases as the path to salvation. Silence, a symbolic language, if ever there was one, is not a Dionysian, but an Apollonian condition. It produces trance-like states generated through contemplation, a very Apollonian enterprise rather than through access. You see, in the Buddha's own time, you had plenty of Apollonian thought, as you have today. Spirit positions, people get into trances, the violence of it all, which I describe in Medusa's, yeah, you see. Tremendous violence and passion, the shaking of the body, orgiastic, and so forth. Not in this. Yet taking Nietzsche's idealized Dionysium at its face value might give us some insights into both Buddhism and Nietzschean thought. Both deny the reality of the ego, but they approach their radical deconstruction of the ego from different perspectives and philosophical positions. The Buddhist position emerges from an argument with Upanishadic Hinduism that existed prior to that time, and from his own experience with meditation. Nietzsche has come from his rejection of the Cartesian ego and enlightenment rationality. Both eschew, eschew an important assumption of a diverse range of Western thinkers who would claim that the limits of language are the limits of thought. Both have conceptions of an authentic mode of existence but built on different premises. It thinking for the Buddhist meditator is a practical possibility. But for Nietzsche and those who follow him, this is a much more complicated task, if not an impossible one, as far as one's own life is concerned. It shouldn't surprise us if Muir had to overcome what he calls his infatuation with Nietzsche before he can accept and give mythic interpretations to his visionary experience. Perhaps Muir did not realize that Nietzsche himself, during a period of illness and loneliness in August 1884, in Sils Maria, just before his death, had his own visions that are fantastic flowers, winding and intertwining, constantly growing and changing forms and colors in exotic luxuriance, sprouting one out of the other. Unhappily, like Schreber, Nietzsche could not give Dionysian meaning to his visionary experience, but rather thought it as a symptom of incipient madness, I quote him, inherited from his own father. Nevertheless, Nietzsche's private reality might have been different because one of his admirers noted that it was, I quote, only in the world of his visions that he can sometimes feel happy until it comes over him that he is for the time being alone in his understanding of them. Buddhist med meditative ascesis itself is a response to the noise the excess of spirit possession and its violent, perhaps orgiastic, trance-induced trans -induced bodily moments. 
In the Nietzschean language game that I have appropriated, one can say that both forms of ecstasy can yield knowledge outside of the discerning ego, and that means through it thinking. But it is hard to believe that Nietzsche could possibly have sympathized with the Apollonian silence of Buddhism. Equally hard for Buddhism to have accepted into its spiritual disciplines any form of noisy Dionysian excess. That is why I think the great attraction of Buddhism to modern intellectuals today. <coughs> you, you can still be a rational human being and also have this Apollonian it experience. For Buddhists, there is no way of piercing the veil of Maya except through meditative disciplines. Even trances such as mirrors are imperfect approaches to the soteriological goal of Buddhism, though in his diaries, mirror comes perilously close to a Buddhist vision of the world, or for, for that matter, a medieval Christian one, in what he calls a waking dream or a walking trance. Here's the example, and with that I finish. Spent an evening, 13th August 1938, in Edinburgh, talking with a and L about immortality. When I returned to the hotel, I sat down on my bed and stared myself in the long mirror on the wall. My face, especially the bony ridge of the forehead, came out. <coughs> and I saw the skin and fresh, flesh shriveling from it, like time being stripped off. And simultaneously, a feeling of journeying on beyond time with that forehead as a prow, and an, and an assurance that the naked bone there would flower into new f flesh and sprout new hair, fragrant and beautiful beyond conception. At the same time, a feeling that I was doing a dangerous balancing feat on the edge of a precipice, that I had gone too far, and that it is not wise to play with death for the sake of immortality. But you see, he didn't have a Kalyanamitra, you see. Yet one might ask, how is it possible to avoid playing with death if one is interested in immortality? Because of many religious virtuosos, the salvation quest, irrespective of whether or not it is expressed in a mode of meditation, must surely mean, as Socrates said, practicing death. But for me, it also means that Muir's vision is not just the intimation of immortality as he thought, but an intimation of my mortality. Thank you. Well, I equated those two, not in a, in a kind of, you know, sort of uh, detailed basis like the one you're saying. Sure, of course, you're, you're quite right on, on that. But the thing about the Polonian experience as <coughs> Nietzsche tries to denigrate it to some degree, you see, uh, <coughs> idealizing the Dionysian one, which obviously Buddhism has very little sympathy for. So in the Apollonian as he presents it, you know, you don't have this kind of excess. <clears throat> and you have the fact that I find it 
the resemblance to Buddhism is that it can coexist with rationality. In fact, that's one of Nietzsche's critiques of Apollonianism. But the point is, very often, at least when anthropologists like uh, Ruth Benedict uh, picked up this whole notion, <coughs> I, th I think it's, it's a mistake. Very often, you see, Apollonianism does, does not deny the visionary experience. On the contrary, uh, the, the title of uh, Thomas Mann's book, The Magic Mountain, you see, uh, that's, the, that's the, the reign of Apollo. So I think there is the element of the magic mountain in the Buddha's, in Buddhist, and any other forms of meditation, you know, visionary experiences. In my book, Imagining Karma, I, I just couldn't deal with here, there are neglected texts in Buddhism where the Buddha acts very much like a shaman, you see. And it is uh, <coughs> still maintaining a, a kind of Apollonian quality. He's in a deep meditative trance. Then he just goes, you see, into the cosmos, like those Tibetan mystics that Janet was speaking about, you see. That's, a, that's one of the first examples of that, developed at great length in, in Tibetan mysticism. And he, he says, I go through battlements, you see. I, then I go up into the skies and touch the moon. You see what I'm trying to get at? So that is Apollonian, but it also has this sort of visionary quality about it, you see. So, so, so the Apollonian, linear, Apollonianism, for me, without the magic mountain, it, it is really not very interesting. Yeah. That was a beautifully complex uh, presentation, I must say. Wasn't it? <laughs> 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 Typical of what we expect from Canada. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, is as follows. Um, Professor Carrasco, who is here, describes uh, elaborately the, uh, the sacrifices, the blood sacrifices uh, of the Aztecs, uh, and of course, their, their uh, visions and their carryings on uh, as shamans. They also have shamans. Um, and we have that on one side, uh, and we have the Buddha on the other. And there's a big difference between them, because the, the difference has to do with, with ethics and morality. And that's what I missed in your presentation. Because one Look, read my whole book. Uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Imagining karma is subtitled ethical transformation in but Buddhism. How does, it, how does it figure in to this analysis that you were presenting? Well, the point in, in this analysis, I'm sort of narrowing the whole thing, and I don't want to get involved in the ethical thing without just getting out of hand. And also the fact that this kind of reaction to the book I wrote, which dealt entirely with ethics, entirely, you see. So, so the point is, I, I want you know, who wants to write the same book? I know friends of mine who do that. <laughs> Hell. Well, but the uh, but as, as case is very interesting. Uh, I'm not disputing that you have, of course, written about ethics elsewhere, but I'm, I am asking you to tell us about the difference between uh, your it is the same sort of thing that, that, uh, uh, that um, Durkheim spoke about as the conscience collective, which, of course, annoyed people particularly in the Anglo uh, world, because they couldn't understand what, what a collective true, yeah. consciousness could possibly be. Uh, yet you're in fact talking about that sort of thing, and maybe Strauss also spoke about that. But the element of, um, uh, of ethics and morality doesn't come naturally out of the conscience. Well, I can, one answer to that question is simply this. I don't think the visionary experience itself deals with such things. They are highly cognitive <coughs> phenomena, and they cannot, to use Freud's language, be transformed into images so easily, you see? That's the problem. That's why I, I juxtapose the, the dream text with the, uh, the visionary text. Even logical processes cannot be, uh, you know. So you have a different cognitive process. The moment the Buddha comes, talks about that, to his disciples, ethics is everywhere, <coughs> everywhere, you see. 
So this is the sort of flip-flop between the it and the I. That's what I'm trying to draw, you see. So now I don't know enough of, of the uh, Aztec case. I have <coughs> in my book in press, Cannibal Talk, uh, some comments on that. But, uh, but you had to wait for that. I and it, um, I, I was brought to, to think about uh, Martin Buber's use of the I-it relationship um, yeah. in, in contrast or comparison to the I-thou relationship. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, if you're designating it, uh, particularly as, as this gentleman said, the sort of collective conscious, yeah. uh, or whether there's a reference to thou? Well, the point is, I mean, I, I'm only minimally familiar with Buba and, and the I and the thou, so it would be presumptuous on my part <coughs> to comment on that. But in this sense, you're right. I mean, well, in fact, explicitly, even, even William James at some point describes what he called <coughs> cosmic religion, you see, as the it explicitly capitalizes the notion. He calls it it. And I've been trying to locate other instances of this. Uh, Plotinus, uh, and I describe Plotinus as um, mystical states, uh, you know, uh, in my book, Imagining Karma, in the Greek part of it. Uh, when he, and again, Plotinus does not have a personal deity, you see. When, uh, and it's an impersonal principle that he reaches for. And he calls it again explicitly it, you see. Um, and I think you know, this is something that I have really to explore uh, in some greater detail. I feel that certain kinds of uh, <clears throat> mystical thought in which you are not so much identifying with or, or relating to God, as in forms of Christianity uh, and in forms of Hinduism, particularly Bhakti Hinduism. There are other ones like the Upanishads, for example, Dawad, that, you know, uh, where God is a kind of neuter. And, uh, and in sort of modern sort of intellectual religion sometimes, <coughs> such as Einstein's, you know, cosmic uh, religion. You have, uh, I think, this it come in. That is, the, uh, the idea to which you reach is an it. Now, I have fully um, begun to con you know, think about those yet, and I plan to in the future when I develop these ideas. This is very, as you can see, a very preliminary kind of statement. You seem in, in uh, your discussion this afternoon to be uh, concerned to collapse or deny a distinction that many others have written about mysticism have been concerned to make. That is, a, a distinction between visionary experience and mystical experience. And in the writings of people who have been called mystics, such distinctions have also been found. Do you find any utility in that distinction, or would you reject it? Well, I think. You know, for my thinking, at least, uh, visionary experience need not be obviously mystical, you see, but mystical experience is often visionary, and that's what I am trying to do with the Buddha's case. Uh, <coughs> but I also, if I, in my later work, I really want to sort of, you see, bridge this gap in Buddhist and Christian uh, mystical experience, and indeed even in certain philosophical traditions, you see. Um, that's why I, I even for the moment brought in uh, Julian of Norwich uh, and the cloud of unknowing, uh, the whole notion of negative theology, which is, you know, in a sense the way that the Buddha expresses through, through negativity, you see, um, or the Upanishads, not this, not that. And certainly, Meister Eckhart, all these people, 
uh, expressed it in, in negative terms. I want to sort of see, you know, sort of bridge that gap between uh, the, the Christian. I don't know enough of Islam, unfortunately, uh, and, uh, and the Buddhists, on, on that level at least. Not on the sort of logical level, but on, on this uh, level. And I also believe, this may be a bit crazy, but you see, the point about Nietzsche, what is interesting, is not only that he had these visions and, he, and <clears throat> he tried to give them private meaning, but in spite of his preoccupation with uh, Dionysianism, he couldn't give it sort of public meaning, you know. He couldn't, like, he was like, trapped like Freud's patients were, or Schreber was. Now, on the other hand, you see, if you look at Nietzsche and you look at Wittgenstein, these are people who spent a great deal of time in loneliness, in isolation. Wittgenstein spent so many times in the cold north, you know, living by himself, you know, sort of in freezing conditions. Um, he rejected, I mean, look at him, he rejected his wealth, you know. Uh, so he was in, indeed a kind of, what I say, uh, a, 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 a mystic of sorts, you see. But I'm, th I'm suggesting that what we call aphorisms, you see, now Nietzsche's thinking is entirely aphoristic thinking. They emerge as aphorisms. Aphorisms occur in such states. He's walking out alone, you know, and suddenly this thought comes. You know, Truth of where is called, so to speak. You know? Then he goes home and writes it down. So I believe that aphoristic thinking, whether it is Wittgenstein or Nietzsche, is this kind of it thinking. I mean, for the moment, it's a trope that I'm using, after all. You see, I'm not presenting that it's some great theoretical term. But it's a trope that helps us to understand what's going on. So even aphoristic thinking, naturally, when you put it down, uh, you, you bring the eye in. You have to. How can you, how can you live in the world without the eye? You know. So that's, that's the line of, of thought that I want to develop at some point. I'm glad you raised that. Byron. Obi, would you say you had a word about the relationship between this kind of it thinking and that type of it think, which has this quality of transcendence and, and the quality of reaching for the imaginary, if you will. With that kind of it thinking that is also that is present in, in Freud in this unleashing of, of rage and murderous rage, or the unleashing of destructive desire, etc., that is also it-like. And what is the, in, in this formulation that you're, that you're going through yeah. here, um, what's the relationship between those two forms of it thinking? Well, I wouldn't call the latter it thinking, you see. To me, it thinking, I, I specify the conditions in which it thinking occurs. As Breuer, using 19th century language, mentioned, it's in a kind of hypnoid or somnolent state. In psychoanalysis, the patient is lying on the couch. In meditation, your consciousness is suspension, suspended to some degree, you see. Uh, even when Nietzsche is out alone, he's by himself. <coughs> Thoughts, you know, just appear. So to me, it thinking loses its force if you sort of drop that context. Whereas violence, as I see it, has none of that, you see. Uh, it is, <clears throat> in fact, produced by rage, you know. And I'm very much interested in violence. Uh, and in my book, Cannibal Talk, I deal with some of that, you see. Uh, I don't think... I want to conflate the two in any way. It lose, my, my argument loses its meaning the moment I conflate the two. Because there's an absence of that contemplative quality in violence. You know, that's the whole point of it. I'd like to have a break, yeah. <laughs>